all the cases against British soldiers in Iraq in which he participated are to be reviewed. The Brexit white paper is published as the government gradually returns sovereignty to Parliament, having refused both a white paper and even yesterday's vote. An angry day for Mr Trump, threatening Iran, furious with Australia over a refugee deal they did with Obama, and even falling out with his reality television successor on The Apprentice. And I want to just pray for Arnold, if we can, for those ratings, OK? Hey, Donald, you take over TV because you're such an expert in ratings, and I take over your job. And then people can finally sleep comfortably again. They were horrific acts of violence. 22 young men groomed and ritually beaten over many years, supposedly to purge them of their sins. One even attempted suicide. The alleged perpetrator, eminent QC John Smythe, ran a Christian charity with close ties to the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury himself. It's all been secret for decades. But tonight, after a six-month investigation, this programme lays bare the scale of the alleged beatings and how the charity and a leading public school failed to report anything to the police at the time. Hampshire police have now launched an investigation, while the Archbishop has apologised, admitting the church had failed the victims. And just to warn you, you may find some parts of this exclusive report very distressing. In every great move of God, there's always a snake in the garden somewhere, and John Smythe is that snake in the garden. A dark secret at the heart of the church. I think we just fell under his spell and we came to believe everything that he told us. Allegations of violent abuse by an evangelical Christian who infiltrated Britain's oldest public school. Bruises are healed and the memories fade, but the questions are being asked again. And claims of a cover-up by his colleagues in the church. Now those who say they suffered at his hands want to be heard. I'm John Smythe, I'm the director of JASA, as we call the Justice Alliance, and my background is as a British advocate. For decades, he was a pillar of Anglican high society. John Smythe, fervent evangelical and moral crusader. He was a high-profile barrister who built his reputation by working with Mary Whitehouse, the moralizer in chief of late 70s Britain. You'll have to talk to my sister about that. They famously sued the newspaper Gay News for blasphemy and even the National Theatre for gross indecency. But it was in the church that Smythe was particularly influential. He was chairman of the Ewan Trust, a Christian group which used to run holiday camps aimed at public school students. The Ewan Trust acts like an exclusive club within the church. It recruits what it sees as the best boys from the best schools, trains them in its own understanding of Christian faith, and then places them in significant places in society, in the army, the politics and the church. And it's been hugely successful in that, for instance, several of the senior bishops of the church, including the current Archbishop of Canterbury, are Ewan boys. In fact, in the late 1970s, Smythe and Justin Welby were colleagues at Ewan. Welby was a dormitory officer at the holiday camps when Smythe was a leader. Afterwards, the two men stayed in touch through the occasional card. We've been investigating Smythe for months. We've uncovered documents and testimony accusing him of running an abusive cult. His victims say he used religion to coerce them into accepting regular and violent beatings, which often left them bleeding for days. We've also learned that in the early 1980s, his colleagues in the church were told about these allegations, but failed to report them to the police at the time. Winchester College, Britain's oldest boarding school. In the 1970s, Smythe was allowed to visit frequently for talks with young evangelicals. But his behavior disturbed one housemaster. I summoned him and I said to him, look, obviously the boys like coming out to lunch with you, but you only invite the good looking boys. As I was saying this to Smythe, he just 
I can't, I won't get it back. He did this. He came right up like this into the fetal position. I thought that was quite extraordinary. Absolutely amazing. And I think, I mean, uh, looking back on it, I'm sure I should have probably gone straight to the headmaster and said, you know, this man is dangerous. Smythe encouraged many teenage Winchester Christians to attend Ewan holiday camps. He then cultivated small groups of followers, exerting a psychological grip over them. He invited them to his house for Sunday lunch, where he would encourage them to follow his strict interpretation of the Bible. Mark Stibby was a teenager when he first went to Smythe's house. The alarm bells for me started ringing when when I was, um, I, was, I was really told that certain things were so serious, seriously sinful, that um, they required drastic measures. What things were particularly sinful in his words? I think that the biggest, the, the sort of unforgivable almost sin, that's probably slight exaggeration, but the, the, the sort of gravest sin was masturbation. So, um, and you know, it seemed to be an obsession. Normally, John would come and pick us up. Another Winchester Christian agreed to return to Smythe's old house to be interviewed anonymously. He says that Smythe suggested to him that if he was serious about repenting his sins, then he should let him beat him. The first time that I had a beating, he, he took me to, it was a sort of garden shed, and um, we walked in and, and I saw a, a couple of canes and I was really shocked because I really didn't have anything like that in mind. Mark Stibby was also beaten. He made me strip off my clothes and he got out a cane and started to beat me. What did he say to you? I think it was along the lines of this, this is the discipline that God likes, this is uh, what's going to help you to become holy. Stibby, like all of the alleged victims we've spoken to, stressed that no sexual acts took place with Smythe but he still realised it was wrong and never returned. Others were not so fortunate. Smythe developed a core group of three students from Winchester who say they were beaten routinely for more than three years, often receiving more than 100 strokes a session. The point that he was making to us the whole time was, how far will you go to demonstrate your faith, demonstrate your repentance. And, and that was his reason behind the escalation. You know, that it came to the point that 30 strokes, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything anymore. The Lord, you know, the Lord's looking for more. Smythe expanded his circle of disciples by following them when they left Winchester to go to university. He asked them to introduce him to their friends. And this is your personal copy of the. This is Bible. given to me by John Smythe. Yeah, really? it's got it's got uh, it's got it there. That used to be called Dicky at, uh, right. at Cambridge. I've got rid of that name. With love uh, from John and Anne. Yeah. Richard Gittins met Smythe after he gave a speech at a Christian society at Magdalen College, Cambridge. Smythe invited him to his home. Soon he was receiving regular beatings like his friends. It was every three weeks and the severity was increasing. And again, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do know that I would have received well over 100 um, strokes, um, possibly 200. And that must have been absolutely excruciating. Well, the bottom bled and we used to have to wear nappies. By 1982, one of the core group says he was struggling to cope when Smythe warned him he was due a beating on his 21st birthday. Feeling trapped, he wrote an anonymous note to Smythe and another senior figure in Ewan, 
threatening to reveal what was going on. There was no response, so he took one last desperate step. I went out that evening and I, I, I went to the chemist and I got some razor blades and I got um, bottles and bottles of aspirin and it was a, it, it, I felt relieved that, that it was all going to be over. Mark Stibby was his best friend. He rushed to hospital to see him. Um, well, I was relieved he was alive because I loved him. But I was extremely angry that it should have come to this. It's, you know, I hate injustice and I think it's unjust. It shouldn't have happened. I mean, you know, and to see someone robbed of his His vitality is, he was such a great guy, you know, I mean, you could not have met a nicer guy. Um, and he was like one of T.S. Eliot's hollow men. I mean, it's like, my friend is a shell, he's... Um, so it's, it's not easy to talk about. I'd like a pause, please. The attempted suicide changed everything. When senior figures at the UN Trust found out, they launched an investigation and shared their findings among some of the trustees. They believed that Smythe had beaten 22 young men. We have a copy of their report, and it makes for extraordinary reading. The scale and severity of the practice was horrific. The other eight received about 14,000 strokes two of them having some 8,000 strokes over the three years. Crucially, the report describes the beatings as technically all criminal offences. It was circulated amongst some of the trustees. Smythe was forced to resign. Ewan warned Winchester College and tried to stop Smythe from working with young people at other organisations. Alarmed by the allegations against Smythe, the then headmaster of Winchester College drew up a document for him to sign. It said Smythe had to stop all contact with his victims. He had to promise to receive professional medical help and he was forbidden from offering spiritual guidance to young people. We don't know if Smythe ever signed the contract. But despite the wealth of detailed evidence, neither the Ewan Trust nor the college contacted the police at the time. A decision which horrifies the man who says he was driven to attempt suicide by Smythe. It's all right, it's all right, it's okay. I'm just gonna put my hands here, just to remind myself that I'm in a completely safe place because it's just taking me back and it's making me think that everything could have been stopped and reported. It, it worries me because it makes me think that if you, with all this information, with this report from one of their own, didn't think it appropriate to go to the police what else has happened? The Titus Trust, which now runs Ewan Holidays, told us the allegations are very grave and should have been reported to the police when they first became known. They say when they heard about the case in 2014, they did contact the police. They have not, however, apologised. Having escaped a police inquiry, Smythe left Britain for Zimbabwe and then South Africa but he returns regularly to Britain. Mr. Smythe, Mr. Smythe, Cathy Newman from Channel 4 News. Uh, we're told that you beat young men until they bled. Why did you do that? I'm not talking about that. What, did you do it? I'm not, I'm not uh, talking about that at all. Well, one victim told us that you drove him to attempt suicide. Do you have any regrets for that? I don't, I'm not talking about this. I'm sorry, it's... Uh, Don't the victims deserve to hear why you did it? How did you know I was here? 
don't the victims deserve to know not, why you did it? I'm not talking about what we did at all. Okay. Please leave us alone. Well, we've spoken to these victims who say that you beat them so hard that they bled. I don't know anything about that. What about Mark Stibby? What about Richard Gittings? All these people, they've spoken to us, they respected you, they looked up to you. Do you think what you did was Christian? I'm not answering any questions. Why did these young men have to bleed for Jesus? There's no question of that at all. Mr Smythe, wh when will you face justice? Winchester College told us they deeply regretted the terrible ordeals of the alleged victims. They say they never sought to conceal events and that the then headmaster told John Smythe never to return to the school. They say they did not report the allegations to the police at the time because it wasn't the wish of the alleged victim's parents. But they are now in touch with the police. Well, after the apology from Lambeth Palace, I went to speak to the Archbishop, Justin Welby, this morning. Archbishop, what's your message to the victims, uh, the alleged victims of John Smythe, who have talked to Channel 4 News? My message is very simple, that, that that should never have happened, that their interests have to come first, that those are the people we care about most. And, um, you yeah, know, the fact that this was a long time in the past and all the rest of it is neither here nor there. They really, really matter. You knew of the allegations in 2013. Do you believe you did enough to ensure that the, vi the alleged victims received justice? Uh, yes. We have a very, very strict system now, which has been introduced over the last four years, five years, and was there before, but has been toughened up a lot, um, so that the moment we're told of anything, the police are told, the lead safeguarding bishop takes responsibility, so nobody has any chance of covering up. Uh, all that is in place now, and, and that is absolutely essential because we want to put survivors first. And I regularly meet with survivors of abuse, listen to their stories, and every time I do, it reinforces in me my own determination. To, to put their interests first. Dr Welby, you just described John Smythe as a charming and delightful man. Do you think he should face prosecution for what he's done? Uh, I, I described him as how he appeared, to, just to put it in context, they said, how did he seem to you at the time? I obviously didn't know that he was um, abusing people in any way at all. Uh, yes, if he's uh, on the assumption that, you know, that if he's committed criminal offences, then he, of course he should face prosecution. What else would he should he face. What did you feel when you heard about these allegations from us? I can't begin to describe it. Um, not because it's John Smythe, but you just think of what the people who are caught up in this went through and what they're still going through and what they will go through for the rest of their lives because of what was done to them. And that's beyond description. Thank you Archbishop, very much. Thank you very much. Well, I'm joined in the studio by theologian Elaine Storkey, a former member of the General Synod who's advised the church on co combating abuse. Also with us is Anne Atkins, who's a religious commentator. Elaine Storkey, first, I just wondered if I could ask you for your reaction to what you've seen in our report tonight. Well, it's a very fine report, um, a superb piece of journalism, <clears throat> and I think the journalistic integrity behind that shines out. Um, but I want to answer your question to him. Was that Christian? And the answer is absolutely not. I mean, there's nothing even remotely Christian about the attitudes he has. Or, and it violates every aspect of Christian theology. Our theology of young people, of, of respecting their immaturity, their vulnerability, their trust. And, and he violated all of that, if this report is true. Well, he, the victims tell us that he read verses from Hebrews chapter 12 to us, which talk about, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What is the psychology of someone who uses those verses to do the kind of things he's alleged to have done. Profoundly worrying psychology. I mean, the man clearly needs ther therapy himself and has needed it for a long time. But the point about the verses in the New Testament, particularly the Pauline verses as well as the Hebrew verses, is to ac accept the fact that our bodies are so important. We have a high view of the body in Christianity and therefore we honour the body. And, and the whole idea of not violating your own body, that's really what the warning is against. But the idea that you must violate somebody else's body 
somebody to draw them in line, <clears throat> that is absolutely reprehensible. Anna Atkins, mm. the point is here that senior figures in the church were told about this in gory detail in 1982, and yet the police weren't told. Yes. Can you explain that? Well, Can you it, understand? It's absolutely shocking, but it is the most important question because we have to ask ourselves, uh, why do we not speak out when we don't speak out? And how can we guard against this happening again? Uh, just to pick up on something you said quite early on in the report, I don't think it's really fair to say the church didn't speak out, the church didn't go to the police. Well, this senior is figures in the church. Well, uh, 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 some clergymen, yes, but the church is millions of people. I, I, the Church of England, you know, there are millions of us in the Church of England. So to say the Church of England is at fault, I think... These were senior bit... people, though. Yes, I mean, you I'm know, not, Mark uh, Ruston gosh, was the vicar uh, yes, who wrote absolutely. the 1982 report. I am not excusing it at all. I'm just saying let's be a bit more accurate in uh, uh, who, who we saying didn't. But... Well, let, let me talk about speaking out, though, because yeah. in 2012, you wrote an article in the mm -hmm. Mail on Sunday yeah. um, which didn't identify That's the right. alleged abuser you wrote about. We understand that abuser was... John Smythe. Smythe, it was indeed, yes. Did you think <clears throat> then about going to the police? Did you go to the police? Uh, the police were given all the uh, enough information to follow it up, and for all I know, that's, that's why it started to come out afterwards. Yes, yeah, several I years know... have elapsed. <laughs> yeah, 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 but that, I mean, that's, that's not my fault and it may not be the police's fault. I don't know how long it took to investigate that, but yes, I mean, it, coming back to your question, why do we not speak out, the flack I received after that article was horrible, actually. Um, for writing about it in yes, the first place? Yes, from people for, in the church, you mean? Uh, yes, for, from, yes, from some people in the church, from friends, from, yes, people <coughs> who were senior <coughs> to me and said, why are you stirring all this up? What does that say about the church? Well, it says that the church recruits from the human race and we can't face the problems that we produce for other people and for ourselves. Um, and it's a pity, you know, in a sense, what we need to do is be as transparent as possible, recognise where there are failures, and there are profound failures in all kinds of institutions, recognise where our failures are, and then do something about addressing them. And do you think those failures go up to the top? I mean, the Archbishop uh, admits that he was aware of allegations against John Smythe in 2013. <coughs> That's quite some time ago now. I mean, do you think he should have made more <coughs> effort to follow through those allegations? Well, he's a very, very new Archbishop at that time. I think he'd only been in office five months. And the, if you know anything about an Archbishop's office, he will be bombarded with information about just about everything going on in the church. And, and he, you know, in a sense, coming to terms with bit by bit. And I, my suspicion is he wasn't given the full story. Well, Winchester College was given the full story and they drew up this contract. <coughs> they didn't report to the police either because they were worried that the parents of the alleged victims didn't want the police to be brought in. Sure. Well, something very interesting that the Archbishop said, again in your excellent report, was the most important people in this are the survivors. Now, if I were a parent of a child who'd been abused, my first thought would be how to get my child through this in the best possible way. I can totally understand the parents putting their own sons first before even the great injustice that had been done. A school, to a certain extent... Again, I'm not excusing this, but to a certain extent, a school's first duty is to the children it's looking after. And my understanding is that they were trying to protect the children. That doesn't make it right, but that's what I think they were trying to do. Briefly, Hampshire police are now investigating. Do you think that the alleged victims will now get justice, particularly as John Smythe now lives in South Africa? It depends on how you define justice. How can you re replace what happened so many years ago, which they will have been carrying through life day after day, year after year? Um, in a sense, the, the hope, I think, is with the Christian faith for them, because the faith is about redemptive living, about reclaiming the lost and you know, starting a fresh and going on. But in order to do that, they do need justice. Elaine Storkey. Anne Atkins, thank you very much for joining us. And if you have been affected by any of the issues we've discussed here, then please do go to our support page, which is channel4.com slash support. And if you'd like to contact us about this story, please email us at channel4investigations at itn.co.uk. And on tomorrow night's programme, our investigation moves to Africa. How John Smythe set up more Christian summer camps for young men and more alleged beatings and one tragic death in mysterious circumstances. By all accounts, had they taken action, would have, this would have been completely avoidable. I find I, it's reprehensible, it's horrendous. Still to come on tonight's programme, as Donald Trump defends his order to bar people from seven majority Muslim nations, 
The British doctor bound for America to a conference who claims she was turned back at Heathrow because officials said the rules have changed. I'm absolutely disappointed, I'm very much disgusted. Um, this is not how anybody should be treated. All cases brought by a disgraced human rights lawyer against Iraq war veterans are being reviewed after he was struck off for misconduct. Phil Shiner was found to have acted dishonestly, including paying a fixer to change his evidence to the £31 million inquiry into the abuse allegations. Paul McNamara has this. They've heard these executions preceded by torture mutilations. The scene you're watching is the aftermath of a supposed massacre that never happened. It's more likely that our clients are telling um, the truth. That voice is the lawyer Phil Shiner, who chased British soldiers for the part he believed they played. That in custody cases... Today, Mr Shiner is a man disgraced, struck off from practising law, found to have acted dishonestly. Today's verdict is long overdue for Colonel James Coote, a young major when serving in Basra in 2004. The time it's taken to bring these investigations to a conclusion has been um, very difficult for me, for my family, um, and I know for the soldiers who I've remained in contact with. Um, so for, for many of us, I'm sure, it will be um, reassuring to be now at the end of a chapter um, and allow us to move forwards. The Al-Swedi inquiry investigated claims brought by Phil Shiner's company, Public Interest Lawyers, against British soldiers following the Battle of Danny Boy in Iraq in 2004. It took five years, cost £25 million, and in the end found that all allegations were entirely the product of deliberate lies. For the last week, Mr Shiner's own actions had been under investigation by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority. And today he had five counts of dishonesty and 12 charges of misconduct proved against him. In 2009, this programme interviewed Mazin Yunus, Mr Shiner's Iraqi fixer. Those people, they will call me and they'll tell me their story. What I'll do is I'll pass it to the lawyers here in the UK. These are very but he didn't just wait for calls. According to this week's hearing, he went to knock doors and carry out cold calling, all strictly forbidden. Soldiers' lives have been made a misery, said the Defence Secretary Sir Michael Fallon today, and that justice has finally been served. But he also said that the Ministry of Defence will study any implications for outstanding legal claims closely. And that's a big question right now. How will this case affect other allegations of abuse? How will this case affect investigations in the future? There have been legitimate investigations, like that of Baha Musa, a receptionist who died in army custody in 2003 after suffering 93 separate injuries. An inquiry found he was the victim of gratuitous violence. Solicitors for soldiers under investigation believe the entire system needs to be overhauled for the good of their clients and those abused. There has to be a fundamental change in how we deal with these cases. If we go into an area of conflict, if we invade another country, um, we have to think of the consequences and the backup, and we have to look after our men and women when they come back from those um, conflict areas as well. There are currently more than one and a half thousand allegations of abuse being investigated by the Iraq Historic Allegations Team, many brought by Phil Shiner and public interest lawyers. Tonight, all of those cases are under review. Now, the government has published its Brexit negotiating plans in a white paper setting out 12 principles from controlling migration to what they call taking control of our own laws. Brexit Secretary David Davis prom promised plenty of engagement with Parliament and the public, but Labour said the document said nothing. Our political correspondent Michael Crick is in Westminster. So, Michael, uh, is Labour right? Well, certainly, I don't think this document, a very grey production, uh, tells us anything new about the government's negotiating position, the 12 principles uh, ahead of the Brexit talks. Indeed, the SNP today uh, described it as simply a laminated version of Theresa May's Lancaster House speech uh, from uh, a fortnight ago, which I suppose is not surprising. This document was rushed out in response to MPs' demands that there should be a white paper. It was clearly cobbled together in a hurry, indeed so much so that at one point there's a serious error. It says that British workers are legally entitled to 14 weeks holiday a year. 
Well, uh, from empty papers to empty houses, Michael. And what's the latest on your allegations about Paul Nuttall, the UKIP leader, and the fact that he didn't um, put the property he claimed on his nomination form on his address? Well, uh, you may recall that last night uh, we revealed that uh, Paul Nuttall had put on his nomination form uh, an address in Stoke-on-Trent uh, as his home, uh, and we discovered that the house uh, was actually empty. And when we caught up with Mr Nuttall yesterday, he told me he'd never actually been there. What are you going to do if somebody makes a complaint? About what? what about about, what? Uh, about your false declaration. It's not a false declaration, sir. It is, because it's not your home. No, it's not. It will. Have it's you, not, ever, have you ever been to 65 Oxford Street? It's not a false declaration at all, OK? Have you ever been to 65 Oxford Street? No, I haven't. People are moving in for me. Well, the returning officer in Stoke-on-Trent revealed today that she was in consultation with the Electoral Commission, uh, having received a complaint from a member of the public. Uh, there's now a police inquiry as well, but the election, the by-election, will have to go ahead on the 23rd of February. Uh, but if Mr Nuttall were to win, uh, then the result could well be challenged. Mr Nuttall himself has uh, revealed that he actually moved into the property last night, uh, spent the night there. He told me today he'd been very comfy. Uh, that is all legally utterly irrelevant. What matters is where Mr Nuttall was living, what was his home at the time he was nominated for the by-election a few days ago. Michael in Westminster, thank you very much. John. He's angry at the Iranians over their missile test, angry at Australia over a refugee deal, angry at Berkeley University after a protest there turned violent. Donald Trump has been venting his fury in another series of early morning tweets, and it didn't stop there. Later, at the National Prayer Breakfast, he had another target, the new host of The Apprentice. From Washington, our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, has this report. What I hear most often as I travel the country are five words, I am praying for you. I hear it so often. I am praying for you, Mr. President. He, by contrast, is praying for Arnold Schwarzenegger, no his replacement on the reality right show The Apprentice. The ratings went right down the tubes, and I want to just pray for Arnold, if we can, for those ratings, OK? <laughs> Who, then, is praying for the rest of the world, thrown into turmoil by this president's aggressive, some would say reckless, foreign policy? There was the call to the Prime Minister of Australia, one of America's closest allies. Mr Trump cut it short because he's furious that his predecessor had agreed to take in 1,250 refugees currently held in camps in Nauru and Manus Island. The president assured me that he would uh, continue with, uh, honour the uh, agreement we entered into with the Obama administration with respect to refugee resettlement. This morning, that assurance was thrown into doubt by a presidential tweet. Do you believe it? The Obama administration agreed to take thousands of illegal immigrants from Australia. Why? I will study this dumb deal. Also on Twitter, he repeated yesterday's statement that Iran had been put on notice for testing a ballistic missile. In 2015, the US, Iran and five other countries signed a deal to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for at least a decade. A deal President Trump is determined to undermine. The then Secretary of State said the stakes couldn't be higher. When I left college, I went to war. And I learned in war the price that is paid when diplomacy fails. President Trump has never seen war and has no experience of diplomacy. Put on notice is a provocation to Tehran and won't go down well with America's allies. I think there's no other way to interpret it as, than other than a threat. I think the Iranians for years have gotten used to these American colloquialisms like all options are on the table. And I think the danger of Trump's foreign policy is that he's very much a unilateralist that rather than building bridges, he even frays relationships with old allies like Australia and Mexico. Enter the man tasked with calming it all down. Former ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson sworn in as Secretary of State last night. This morning, trying to offer reassurance to worried career diplomats. I know this was a hotly contested election and we do not all feel the same way about the outcome. Each of us is entitled to the expression of our political beliefs. But we cannot let our personal convictions overwhelm our ability to work as one team. Yesterday, President Trump got on Marine One 
accompanied by his daughter and the man who carries the nuclear codes. He was visiting the family of a special forces officer killed during a botched raid on supposed al-Qaeda members in Yemen. It's under investigation because several women and at least one child were killed. The first such raid of this administration may well have been, in the undiplomatic language the president might use, a disaster. The After the president's right jibes the at this morning's prayer breakfast, Mr. Schwarzenegger responded. Hey, Donald, I have a great idea. Why don't we switch jobs? You take over TV because you're such an expert in ratings, and I take over your job. And then people can finally sleep comfortably again. Hmm? Marine One flew past the monument commemorating Washington, the first president. The 45th, the man on board, is like no other. His words are undoubtedly keeping world leaders up at night. And Lindsay joins us now live from Washington. Uh, Lindsay, um, are these provocations some kind of strategy or simply a diplomatic disaster? Well, it, what it looks like is that it isn't really a foreign policy, just a series of outbursts, because things don't fit together. The president is on record as wanting closer relations with Russia, but the Russians are quite close to Iran. The Russians will not be happy about this Iran policy. And then when you, you look at what's likely to happen in Tehran, there was a provocation from the Iranian side. They did test that ballistic missile. They attacked uh, the, the um, Houthis, who they support to some extent in Yemen, attacked a Saudi ship. Now, Sean Spicer, the uh, president's press secretary, they described that as our ship. It isn't a US ship, it was a Saudi ship. And it's not clear how much the Iranians support the Houthis. So there's a lot of loose thinking going on, and that's what will be alarming people in the State Department. It was interesting to notice Rex Tillerson, when he went into that meeting this morning, he apologised for being late. He said that was because the prayer breakfast had gone on a little longer. He said maybe this year people feel that they have to pray a little more. Lindsay, now one of Donald Trump's most controversial executive orders is his travel ban covering people from seven mostly Muslim countries. It shouldn't have affected Dr Abdelhaki Al Husseini, a British national who works as a consultant cardiologist in the NHS. She often travels to the United States, but yesterday morning, when she arrived at Heathrow, airline and US immigration officials stopped her from boarding her flight, saying only the rules have changed. Dr Al Husseini says she hasn't breached any of the temporary ESTA visa rules and was left feeling utterly humiliated. I spoke to her earlier. I had made my journey as normal um, to the airport to take a flight to a conference in Washington. I was uh, denied uh, to go on to the flight uh, on the basis of the fact that I had a visa um, off Iraq in my passport. Um, despite trying to kind of understand a bit better at the airport, I, I, I didn't really come to a sense of exactly why I was denied from going to the States. I travelled to, to America almost once a year. My last entry was in January of last year with exactly the same passport, um, exact, exactly the same credentials, nothing has changed. And I don't think they could even at the airport tell me exactly what has happened or what's different to today as opposed to last year. Did they mention the, the latest measures? Did they mention that Mr. Trump had made some changes? At the end, when I was interviewed by the immigration officer, and though she was um, very sympathetic to my cause at the end and saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you, she did mention that, yes, things have changed, and certainly that has an impact um, to why I can't travel, uh, which was yesterday, essentially. I couldn't travel out to Washington yesterday. Do you think they picked you out because, in some way, they sensed that you might not be a white British? I have to admit, I certainly felt discriminated from that the first minute I, I kind of arrived at the airport. I was trying to do an online check-in the day before. This is with um, the United Airlines. Um, I was. It kept on saying, as soon as I put in my name and my reference number, it kept on saying that I should go and check in at the kiosk. As soon as I arrived, before I even made it to the kiosk or the desk, um, I said, you know, they asked me had I checked in, and I said no, I was, I couldn't because of this reason, and I was kind of told to step aside, and my passport was immediately taken. Um, so I did feel singled out for my name. Uh, being of an Arab nature, it kind of made them very cautious about who I am and who I was, despite the fact that I'm a British citizen. The only passport that I hold is actually a British passport and I have no other nationality. 
How do you feel as an accomplished cardiologist uh, about to go and present a paper in Washington and prevented from flying? I'm absolutely disappointed, um, very much disgusted. Um, this is not how anybody should be treated. Um, I speak for myself, for my colleagues, uh, for many academics and doctors. We all travel back and forth across the Atlantic o Ocean to present our work, to share our data, to collaborate with researchers. Um, and this is not the way forward. Um, I, I, I don't think anybody should be treated like this. It comes from the American end as well, where I received an email today from the chair who'd invited me to this conference saying that they were absolutely appalled by this um, and whether they can do anything to help. And certainly this is not how they see um, future work in, the t in terms of research being conducted um, if this is the way America is going to hold its um, foot down, basically, on, on people travelling. Will you talk to the American embassy? To be honest, the reason I'm on this, I'm being interviewed and the reason I've come forward is because I don't think this should happen. This isn't right. One, I'm a British citizen. I didn't think I would be affected by any of this. Two, this affects me and other academics and doctors who want to travel across to the United States. I will certainly be hesitant. Um, you know, one, I don't know if I'll get a visa. Two, you know, it's a very time consuming process that I don't think I should be going through. Um, and three, you know, it has an impact on many people who would want to travel now and think twice about their travel. So um, I think certainly it, it may be something that I will take on, but not at this moment. Dr. Al Hosseini, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you, John. We approached the Foreign Office for a response. They've promised us one, but it hasn't come through yet. United Airlines, uh, they've responded that they do not disclose information on customers, saying Homeland Security is responsible for entry into the United States. But this program does understand that the airline will now refund the cost of Dr. Al Hussein's ticket. Homeland Security has yet to respond to our request. The Foreign Office have told us they're ready to offer assistance now to Dr. Al Hussein. The Bank of England has announced a dramatic rise in its growth forecast for the next two years, whilst keeping interest rates on hold again. And the bank's governor had a wider message, saying politicians are becoming more important to the world economy than central banks. Our business correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, is with me now. Helia. Uh, well, John, it seems that the UK economy has been growing at quite a click. In fact, we've been catapulted now to the head of the G7 nations. The Bank of England today said that UK growth this year was going to be at 2%. That's opposed to the 1.4% they were predicting just three months ago. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a concern about the coming squeeze on the UK household. Um, inflation is going to be above the Bank of England's 2% target, but it's going to be fractionally better than they thought in November. Now it's going to peak at just 2.7% as opposed to that 2.8%. And the point here, John, is they don't think inflation is spiralling out of control. What about growth? Why have the forecasts improved so much? Well, they've had to revise this up a few times since the referendum and the governor today explained that 50% of this was thanks to the chancellor and the fiscal measures that he brought in in the autumn statement. Another 25%... Well, that's politics abroad. Thank you, Mr Trump, and the fiscal stimulus that's expected there. There's a chunk down to the benign kind of credit environment. And the final bit, well, the British consumer who's gone on spending and spending despite Brexit. But isn't this continued consumer spending actually quite worrying? Well, I think the bank has a problem here because, on the one hand, if the consumer spending stops too quickly, the UK economy is in real trouble. On the other, the governor's clearly worried. You could see that in his comments about the savings ratio. Now we're forecast to save just about 3% of our disposable household income. Well, John, that is the lowest level since records began in 1963. But I just finally wanted to tell you about the comments that Mr Carney made about the waning power of bankers because he invoked the spirit of Andy Warhol saying the 15 minutes of fame for bankers, central bankers, had come to an end. Now, whether you think central bankers are bazooka superheroes or villains that have distorted the market, politicians have been playing second fiddle to them since the financial crisis. What Mr Carney seemed to be suggesting is the age of the central banker is coming to a close.
I wonder if you could reflect on whether it's becoming more difficult to be a central banker when political commentary is becoming more and more influential and more unpredictable, and specifically whether you think it's right for politicians to criticize other governments' currency policies. Well, let's see how I can get out of that. Um, <laughs> the, um, I think the, uh, what, what I'd say is, is that you know, we're in, in many respects, we're coming to the last seconds of uh, central bankers' 15 minutes of fame, if to use the, you know, the Warhol uh, line, uh, which is a good thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to quibble about specific comments at, at, at specific times in, in, in what is a, you know, a general posi generally positive uh, direction of travel. The other big story in the city today was about the HBOS scandal. Here's my report now. HBOS, at the heart of so many scandals in the financial crisis. Today, some of its bankers jailed for a £245 million loan scam that involved prostitutes, payoffs and lavish yacht trips to Saint-Tropez. At the heart of it, Lyndon Scowfield, an HBOS manager sentenced to 11 years and three months. He took bribes to push small companies under his care into the hands of consultant David Mills, today sentenced to 15 years. Aided by his wife Alison and Michael Bancroft, he would extract crippling fees from businesses who had banked with HBOS. John Cartwright and Mark Dobson, another HBOS manager, also helped in the fraud. This case highlighted the greed, audacity and outright criminal corrupt behaviour of these individuals convicted for their part in destroying hard-working people's small businesses. Mills lavished the HBOS banker with luxury holidays and cruises, a £3,000 watch and even paid to provide prostitutes. The business which Scowfield pushed to Mills was lucrative, financing this £2 million yacht and a string of fast cars. But many viable small businesses were ultimately ruined and sometimes taken over by Mills. Eventually, the growing complaints led to the scam being uncovered. I think a lot of the victims have been, us included obviously, but so many people have been to hell and back because of this. And I'm, so I'm really pleased with today's results and I'm, I'm really pleased that the police have done such a great job. And finally, against all odds, we've seen... Uh, we've six seen people go to jail. The lurid details of this case brings back memories of everything that infuriated people at the height of the financial crisis. In an orgy of sex, bribes and predatory practices, a small group of bankers collected rewards at the cost of their customers. Judge Beddoe's sentencing said the case revealed utterly corrupt senior bank manager letting rapaciously greedy people get their hands on vast amounts of bank money and their tentacles into ordinary and honest businesses. How are you? Almost a decade on and the taxpayer has still not been paid back for its £20 billion bailout. Now the Turners, along with several other victims, will have to start their fight for compensation, no doubt hoping their wait won't be so long. Helia Ebrahimi reporting. After the break, seeking refuge but finding no comfort. The British Red Cross finds almost 15,000 refugees and asylum seekers in the UK are now classed as destitute and they're relying on charities for help. <laughs> Welcome back. Now they've escaped conflict or persecution, but almost 15,000 refugees and asylum seekers in the UK are now classed as destitute, 10% higher than last year. The British Red Cross, which compiled the figures, is meeting the Home Office tomorrow, as our senior Home Affairs correspondent Simon Israel reports. In this British Red Cross drop-in centre in a Manchester church, the destitute are growing. Syrians, Eritreans, Sudanese, Kuwaitis and others arrive every week at the very least to be fed. One-fifth are already officially designated refugees but are struggling just to survive. This Syrian couple have come for food parcels. The husband got refugee status three years ago. His wife and two children joined him last year. They have a roof over their heads 
but not much else except debt. They are grateful, legal, but broke. He has family still living outside Damascus, so we agree to protect his identity. So why are you here today then? We need food parcels to survive, he says. There's been no support for my children. We are in difficult times. Close to 15,000 came calling on the Red Cross in the UK last year, needing help to survive. An increase of 10% on the previous year. Malik, a 53-year-old Nigerian, is one of them. He's here every week while he awaits a response to his asylum appeal. Diabetes is slowly destroying him. At times I beg on the street for me to survive. I have to beg. What's going to happen to you when you leave here later this afternoon? If I leave the centre for next week now, then I, I don't... I mean, I've got nowhere to go. I've got no one to support me. And I say, if not for this centre, like I said, things will have fallen apart. The rise in destitution among those granted refugee status is of particular concern. Support ends 28 days after asylum is granted. Not nearly long enough, argues the British Red Cross, as it witnesses more and more in desperate straits. Well, it's certainly a crisis, but I would think it's what you call a, almost a silent crisis. We know there are thousands of people within the asylum process with refugee status who are struggling to put food in their bellies, to have a roof over their heads, and that is a crisis. But it's a crisis that's not that well known, so I think we need to shine a light on the fact that life within the asylum process is difficult. This family is originally from Kuwait, where they were stateless and persecuted. The father was granted asylum. His wife and children arrived three months ago, and already they are dependent on food parcels. The children don't qualify for free school meals. Do you come here every week now? Their mother says that for them, the visit to the drop-in centre is their highlight of the week. Tomorrow, the charity will present its evidence to the Home Office. In the current climate, though, it's difficult to see them getting a sympathetic hearing. Simon Israel, that's all for tonight. That's Channel 4 News. Good evening. Good evening.